Retrofit or that our old code will work with the new change we make to certain blocks and certain pieces like that. So with Logics Designer, now this is going to be a quick run through of some of the stuff we've added over the last few years. I will do it really quick. Um, with the new controllers that we've got the capability of storing all of the program data in there. So run comments, descriptors, stuff like that in the non-volatile memory, which makes it easier to handle the, uh, to, to upload your code and see what, what you've done. Um, we've done a lot to try to improve the, your time to market on different things. Come on, populate, there we go. So we've also changed the way that we look at our code. We've added another option. So we typically have this controller organizer where we look at everything based on how it's gonna be scanned in a, in a controller. So if it's gonna be scanned in the background continuously, or if it's gonna be scanned every so many milliseconds or only on an event, we've made it so now you can compartmentalize your code based on what the function is. So instead of how it is being scanned, you can put it together logically. This is this part of the machine, this is this part of the machine. So I'll show you that later on. We also made it so that you can drag and drop programs and so on from one system to another, basically meaning you can build a project that you could call a library project. It's got all your different add-on instructions or your programs, and you can literally just drag them in and have it reinstance those when you drag them into your new project. So any name conflicts, it can automatically correct for you. It'll pop up a prompt and ask you, hey, these two things are gonna conflict. What name do you want me to use? We also have added, program parameters, which in and of themselves are a great idea. The implementation of them across your project can be a bit of a conundrum because we added the ability to have inputs. Hello, echo. Oh, come on, Luis. There we go. <clears throat> Sorry, I, was, I always have to fiddle with him. So the uh, program parameters basically allow us to have inputs, designated outputs like we would on an add-on instruction. We also have input in outs and then you also have a public parameter as well as your standard locals like we're used to. So the public parameters basically makes a local tag that is can be seen globally in any other program. You just call it by using the backslash and then the name of the program dot the tag name. So basically each program now becomes its own UDT. So it's a, it has its own user defined data type effectively behind the scenes. So when you go to play around with your parameters, you, it, it's nice to use inputs and outputs in your code for the purpose of being able to track next time you go to use them, which ones are supposed to be inputs and which ones are supposed to be outputs. Other than that, that's really about the only purpose I've seen in those for the most part, because we don't call a lot of these programs like you would in a function block. You know, you don't just drag a function block in for an add-on instruction. You know, you know how you do that with an add-on instruction, you don't do that with a program. So they're called a little bit differently, so that, that function doesn't necessarily carry over as cleanly as some people think it does when you first start out doing it. So, just, so everybody's aware that using the inputs and outputs, use those more for future so that you remember that this is supposed to be an input and I need to tie it to something. Then actually using it truly as an input and thinking that you're gonna pass data to it the way you would in like fun function block diagram. So we've improved that in version 24. We're on 32 now, so this is, like I said, history. We're just catching up. So we've gone and added in the extra piece of doing programs now so you can scale, make compartmentalize a program where all of your tags are, lo are local. You can do aliasing to global tags. You can do aliasing on your inputs, outputs to global tags. And that basically allows you to copy this one, say I've got a pump program that's designed to run this, maybe a, a tank that's got pumps and other stuff attached to it. Boss says, hey, we need to add a second one. You just instance that you know, make a copy of that program, make a new one, 
call it tank two, and you add the tank, the pumps, all of it, now you just have to go associate it with the appropriate I.O. And then also make sure you interlock certain pieces like e-stops and so on. So there's gonna be a few tags you're gonna to have to play with when you do that, but it really cuts down on the amount of time. You don't have to rebuild the code from the ground up. And then with the logical organizer, we can sort stuff by its function. So not, not by how it's scanned, but the actual function. So this kind of shows the difference between, so on your right, you'll see all of the, uh, the way it is actually being executed. And on, in the middle, you'll see the logical organizer, which is talking about how the system is. What is it? So in this case, line one, I sort all of my line one programs, which are very much intermingled in the standard view, which we have on the right. It sorts them into, I can sort them into line one. So when I go to look at the system later on, once it's been commissioned, it's been working and suddenly doesn't want to work anymore. I know that, hey, this is a line one problem. I can go look at my line one programs and not have to figure out, well, is this in this interrupt or because typically line one is all over the place. So for those on the WebEx, there's a little bit of hand waving going on there. So we have, we've added an architect. So the architect's been around, I think we're at revision four now of architect with version, when version 32 came out of studio. So this is actually a little bit of an older slide, but basically an architect takes the ability where I was talking about having a studio 5000 program as your library, as you drag things out of architect takes it one more level where you can actually build a library in architect and drag things in. You can also within architect, use that to populate your HMI. So you can add in pieces to the HMI. You can also link for produce consume tags between controllers. So you can have multiple, multiple programs linked together inside of an architect piece. So again, further streamlining the building process. So, and then IAB can export into Architect. So anybody that actually uses an integrated architecture builder to build their system, the more correct you make integrated architecture builder, the better results are when you export it into Architect, especially like the IP addresses since it likes to use weird ones in integrated architecture builder. But that will come over. Anybody that uses ePlan for uh, electrical schematic development, you can actually export and import between so simplifying some of the drawing side for, for drafting your schematics. So then you can also you know, create logics and view programs and you can export, you can correlate, you can go work, work back and forth between. So you can go make changes in your logics program and then come back and resync it with the system. So our architect is a very strong tool for that. And then you can build your own library. So you've got your library you can build your own and use it to hold all of your pieces of code, drag them into your controller where you want them to be, or programs and so on. So not just add on instructions, but also programs. We have another tool called Application Code Manager. It is, oh. They work subtly different. Yeah. So you can, you can build them both, but you can't just take one piece and shove it in the other one. Application Code Manager requires more information. So the library within uh, Architect basically is no different than taking a piece of code that's in another program and dragging it across. It just puts it in there and says, there you go, go have fun. Architect allows you to actually go in and populate names of tags and interlink tags between, app, between pieces of programs that you add in. So you, you need to give it a lot more data when you actually build one of those blocks in Application Code Manager. You can also link HMI stuff directly to it in Application Code Manager, where an architect, they're gonna be two separate. You know. The big part is they're not synchronized, so what you can do in application code manager, you can then port over to architect. Because the way I usually see architect is from a 
a little bit more on the end user side. So when you're done with the project and your commission, especially when it comes to the libraries, you now use that to be able to see a graphical representation of everything. You can also use it as a code generation side at the beginning part where you're taking something from IEB, moving that to architect, and that'll start your ACD file. So usually at that level, then you're now using application code manager to create your actual code. Whereas architect is only creating the structures inside of your code, producer, consumer, library tags, importing your AOIs from your library, those type of things. Any other questions? All right. So application code manager takes everything a step further. I've got one more slide on application code manager since that is, it, it really is the epitome of modular programming but it's outside of where most of us ever seem to go. So the, uh, it, it, with the free version of Application Code Manager, you can take any of the standard plant PAX library and implement it into a piece of code, into an HMI. If you want to build your own content, that is a yearly license for that, for, for the librarian, the person that actually manages the content. So, but that is the uh, Application Code Manager, but it does allow for you to be able to basically create an application, open it up in Studio, download it to a controller and hit run. That was one of the labs that we did was basically the blocks worked well enough together that when you put in the tag names, when you're building it, you opened up Studio 5000 only for the purpose of downloading and monitoring. We didn't actually make any changes in the code. So it, it, it does have that type of power, which is much beyond architect. So it allows for doing instances, multiple different variants of the same thing and tying them together and then also creating all of your HMI graphics. And it can either populate them, just dump them onto the HMI screen or you can actually have them populate at a specific position so that your screen replicates the way that it typically is. So this is what happens when you let me design slides. <laughs> so where do we start? How do we figure out what a function should be? When do we use an add-on instruction versus a program? Those are very kind of personal questions as we sit down and think about how we want to architect a system and where it makes the most sense to divide it. Because sometimes you'll find that you're using maybe a few add-on instructions in a program. So you may end up compartmentalizing these or calling an add-on instruction from another add-on instruction to help compartmentalize the different pieces so you can prove out the code once and you know that it works, now I just call it. So in a case of like a mixing tank, where do I start? Like what, I've got the overall unit, okay. If I'm gonna sell 400 of these, or I'm gonna install 12 of them or something like that. Maybe I compartmentalize the entire system at some point, but you know, trying to do that directly is kind of like eating an elephant. That, you know, I got my fork, but it's gonna be a while. So, you know, we can break that down into little pieces. All right, so we've got a, this tank, this mixing tank, but we also have pumps, we have valves, we have these assemblies that we want to control. So we break it apart and say, okay, well, what are these functions or assemblies that we want to look at? And then all the way down to individual components. So we can look at compartmentalizing a function. We can also compartmentalize components. Two different schools of thought. They're different, completely different. You don't typically compartmentalize functions and components because sometimes you end up with a little too much modularization. It ends up being a little too difficult to implement sometimes. So sometimes you only, you only compartmentalize one. Sometimes, and, and sometimes you end up with a, with a function that is made up of a bunch of components and you do it that way. There's also different ways of doing control. So when you stand back and look at the overall system, you've got a couple different methods. The method that a lot of people typically use is I've got the main control system, the control layer of the, the is actually owning every function in the machine tells it what to do, doesn't do anything else until that's done, it does, and, and errors off of that, and so on. 
there's other schools of thought that basically says let each function know when or whether or not it can run and then send it a request to go. So your overall architecture says, am I allowed to run? And if I am allowed to run, go do this. And then at the next step, it tells something else to go do that and waits and, and make sure that it's done before it moves on, but doesn't actually get down into the individual control of the system. So basically setting a, setting a bit to say, turn on the pump and then won't move to the next step until the pump is running. So once the pump is running, it moves to the next step. And that's your supervisory system can be as simple as that. So depending on how you architect your code, you can go both ways. So sometimes when you get into breaking down the code, it's how do you want to pass the control down? So again, the, there's multiple different ways out there. There isn't necessarily you should do it this way. There's you can do it multiple different ways depending on how your machine works. If it's a very sequential system, you may want to break it down into where the devices do their own thing. If it's everything has to work together and there isn't really so much of a sequence, step one, step two, step three, you may want to have the machine operate as a complete unit as compared to the subroutines doing their own thing. So does that make sense? Getting a bunch of nods, so apparently I'm doing a decent job. So the next step is to AOI or not to AOI? It's too, too bad I don't get to drink anymore. This would be even better. So, and you can tell I was also a little hungry when I wrote this. Um, so, the AOIs are great. They, they work really well, but there's a few limitations to them, and one of them is you can't edit those online. You have to go offline to change them. Now, there's a few people in the room that I know that have systems that can't go down, and if they can't go down, how do I change AOI? You know, especially if I realize two months down the road that I thought I proved it out, but I didn't. And so now it's like, I got to take it down to fix it, but I can't take it down because it's running. So you end up in a situation where you're trying to rebuild code, build a second AOI, leaving the first one in there, trying to make the second one be okay, or build a little routine that you can use in place of it. So AOIs are great as long as you prove them before you get out into the situation where you can't modify. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, yeah, avoiding that one are you <laughs> so that's the uh the, the general limitations i mean one of the benefits of aois is like revision control and everything is designed to be a block it's designed to be used that way so they're very easy to easy to move around easy to handle very specific in how you use them in code because you drag them into like function block or ladder and you know what the inputs and outputs are. So there, there, there are benefits and downsides. The downsides are actually fairly minimal. Um, there used to be a couple other downsides as far as what you could do inside of an AOI, as far as certain program routines, certain like get system variables or message instructions, certain things like that, that you couldn't redefine. Some of those have been, in, have been removed, some of those hurdles. So looking at the different tag types, we have inputs, which when you use them in a piece of code are read only. You cannot write to those other than externally. So you use those only as inputs. Outputs basically don't know what their value is until you write to them. And inputs in out basically is a value that's coming in, then you can modify it or not modify it and then it will leave. So in systems where you're passing a single parameter through multiple different blocks, sometimes in, in outs actually simplify your code. So it may simplify, but sometimes makes it a little more complicated as to what modified the value. <laughs> if you're trying to figure out what was causing your problems. And then there's public parameter, which is gonna be basically a global tag. And I've, I've found those to be very, very useful because then you can still compartmentalize your tags into a program, but you can reference them globally. So at a little bit more than a local. Uh, 24, 26, 24. I saw six fingers, that's why I was wondering. 
well, from here it just added up. It looked like you just forgot to extend your thumb. <clears throat> so version 24 for. So again, we're talking about the inter interconnection options. We got to linking with tags directly, um, using the public parameters. Um, if you try to use the inputs and out tags as input output tags, and you want to use, you know, a supervisory program or something, you're going to have to you're going to have to use those if you use input output tags because you have to have a way of mapping an output of one program to an input of another program. So you end up typically with a mapping program set up. So that's why I've seen a lot of people use input tags and then public parameters for outputs sometimes or or a note that's on all of their output tags that they're an output so that you can keep track of, of what is what and not have to have that supervisory mapping program that handles all the handshaking. So for those of us that play in the OEM world where we're building the same machine that's exactly the same except, you know, every time the boss comes down, yeah, it was just like this one except. So we have the we have capabilities and ways of interrogating cards, interrogating modules. So not necessarily just cards, but drives and you name it, using get system variables, using message instructions. The the new one that's come out is the ability to actually to actually pull the path for a module using a get system variable, and that one allows you to take it to one to the next level, where you can actually pass the path into an add-on instruction, now allowing you to use a message inside of an add-on instruction. So that was always one of the limitations. If I did a message instruction inside of my, inside of my add-on, I was pretty well stuck with only ever writing to this one piece of equipment. <laughs> so now I can make that a variable and pass it. So, and more dynamically. You could always hard code that as a variable and pass it in before, but now it's even better with this capability. So now that you can access access that, you just use a piece of code just like that. So for those that want to inhibit a module programmatically, so I'm building the same machine except, you know, typically I built, you know, I built a program that'll have every possible option, every possible combination. That way I'm done. And all I have to do is configure whether I've got this card, this card, this module, this drive. And so if you wanted to turn off a drive, well, the code still stays there for it. Programmatically, you just don't run the code for it. You just say, okay, we're not worried about that one. But what do you do for the, for the module, for the actual drive itself? You'll get that flashing IO light because it's physically missing because the customer didn't pay for it. <laughs> so they didn't want that option. So you can go in there and inhibit that using the code. So simply writing a value of four to the mode will inhibit a module using an SSV. It is as simple as that. If you ever want to uninhibit it, write a zero to it. So typically when you're doing OEM style machines and you're building the same thing, you typically build an HMI screen that's the first screen to pop up that says, what am I? I am this type of machine. What options do I have? I've got this, 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 this option. And then it goes in there and turns on and off all of those bits the way you want them. Then your cards are configured. You know what, it knows what it is. Your IO light goes gr solid green. It's nice and happy. And then you hit a button saying I'm done with configuration and that screen, you can make that screen hide itself so it never comes back up. So that your customer never sees it and starts messing about with what different options the machine may or may not have. And you can set that multiple different ways, but basically make it so that once that comes up, and you hit I'm done with it, the bit that allowed all of that code to run will never let that code run again. So there's plenty of ways to backdoor your way into allowing that bit to turn back on. You know, different, hit this button, hit this button, hit this button. I've written a couple of those in my, in a previous life. There were 20 buttons deep. You had to go to 20, there's 20 different actions on the HMI in a certain period of time and it turned that function back on. And made it long enough they couldn't write it. It was fast enough they couldn't write it down and long enough they wouldn't be able to remember it. Yeah. 
So one of the other topics we were talking about was alarming. So we've come out with this new way of doing tag-based alarming. So for everybody that's ever done anything on the alarm side, we've got a couple different methods of it. And it's basically, you're either continuously pulling the controller for alarms, or you're using the ALM, ALM, ALMD functions inside to push the alarm to the factory talk alarm and events. So the data just keeps going back and forth and there's limitations to both methods. And so with the alarm and events method, we basically own that configuration inside of the controller. We are passing that data up to the HMI saying, hey, this is what happened, this is when it happened. There's additional code that goes with it so you can silence alarms and so on. Show, I believe the term is shelf, but you can hide the alarms, basically acknowledge them and so on and the HMI does what it needs to do, and it's all controlled inside of the controller. The reason for doing it inside of the controller is I get the best scan time, timestamp accuracy. I was right there when it happened. I know what the order was, that, that I know when that fault happened. So if I have cascaded faults, which is very typical, you hit an e-stop and everything goes into fault, you know that the e-stop was hit because you were there when that happened, and you saw that all of the everything else cascaded from it. So you can say, hey, this one was first. If you use the old fashioned, just tag based alarms, where you just set a tag a, a bit inside of the controller that the HMI is looking at, every second it looks at that bit. Well, one second after you hit the e-stop, it looks at the bit and says, oh yeah, the e-stop's been on. Oh, by the way, these other, other hundred faults happen. <laughs> and so they all come in with exactly the same timestamp and you have no idea which one was first. So then we write other pieces of code to complicate things, figure out which one was first, or we use the ALMA, ALMD functions. So within, on the server side, we've got a lot of configuration of how we want all of these alarms to work. So within, but within logics, we were basically looking at, you know, this is the alarm, this is what I want it to do, and and it takes up a decent amount of space for all those that have actually ever used the ALMA and ALMD functions. So, you know, we've already talked about why. So there's a couple different variants of when I'm trying to use different types of alarms and when what I use them, server side versus logic side. I've actually almost always been a strong proponent that they should go in logics as long as they fit. Because that gives you your best accuracy. The other piece of that is if for whatever reason you lose communications to the HMI, the controller still knows there's an alarm. So when, once you get back into it, it's like, hey, we're still an alarm. You know, so it knows what happened and when it happened. So, but it also eats up a lot of data and execution time. So with the new controllers in version 31, we've added in tag-based alarms. And basically they have a that really the core functionality of the ALMA and ALMD alarms, but they're more, compar more, more compartmentalized and optimized and sit off to the side and use a different function of the memory. So they are a lot faster and take less scan time and take less coding and memory. So with these, you can figure them so you'll end up in Studio 5000, you configure your alarms, you can set them up, you can set up groups, you can set what, what tag they're going to, what class, and so on, the same way you would any other alarms, and use them, and they all get, pat, they get passed up, so the only limitation right now is you're using either Factory Talk View SE, or you're using a Panel View 5000 with version five, or later. So those are the limitations with using the, to that, the advanced tag-based alarm. Yes. Yes, they look identical. So within Vue SE, you can set up multiple different types of alarms. You can set up tag-based alarms talking to older equipment, PLC-5s, or non-Rockwell equipment that don't have the alarm and events functionality. And it'll look identical to a tag coming out of Control Logics from 
AALMA and look identical to a tag coming out of uh, the next gen control logics in L8 running the tag based alarms. So from an operator's perspective, they all look the same. You just it added that extra granularity of time in there. Uh, purely tags. So you set uh, you set limits. Yeah. That's a Louise question. If you're using the logic tag ones, you can still have it. Uh, the I haven't seen the path, but the the option on how you would set it up. So the question is if we can have the logic tag base and the HMI tag base interact the same way because there's a little command line there that you can make it so it pops up. The answer is yes. The only thing that I haven't looked into is if the path changes. Because when you're doing the subscription from an HMI standpoint, you know where the clients are sitting. From a controller standpoint, there's no interaction of what the screens look like. So the command may be different, but the idea is that it should be able to give you the same functionality of being able to do pop ups. All right. So next gen controllers minimize the impact on the on the scan time. So and this is what the memory sizes look like. So using an ALMA or an ALMD would take up a decent amount of memory inside of our controllers and the, the tag based alarm still takes up memory, but a lot less. So giving you an additional capability. Now it also reduces the scan time, but when you're dealing with the L8, you've already reduced your scan time by a factor of seven. Yeah, like literally it's one seventh of what it used to be. So it is a little less noticeable that you've had that giant improvement because you've already got a 7x improvement anyways. So the size of those is the same regardless of which controller. Um, controller wise to use the logics based you have to use the L8 series controllers and version 31 or later. Yes. So one of the other benefits of using some of the tag based alarms is it allows you to do a little bit of UDT magic where you can dynamically define what the alarm is supposed to say or what it's going to do or how it's going to act. Meaning you can put tag based alarms inside of like add on instructions and so on and we'll give the appropriate Enunciation to the HMI. So th there is a, a benefit when using those when doing modular programming because now you can very easily manage all of your alarms. And again, Rockwell trying to make it easy, you can import export from XML. So, so I know everybody's a little scared. These two words seem to terrify an awful lot of people. So before I even dig into structured text, I want to talk about why most people are scared of structured text. And basically what it boils down to is almost anybody that works on any of our controllers or anybody else's controllers, reading ladder is pretty much the standard. Structured text takes a little bit more knowledge on how it executes as it's not as visual. So you have to spend a little bit more time thinking and the more complicated you make your code, the more information you need to remember. Because as you look at different conditions in ladder, you've got a couple of contacts on a rung. It's very easy to see that these, these three are on and I'm good to go. Where in structured text, you need to evaluate each individual bit and where and, and how they're grouped together to determine whether there actually is a unit good or not for getting into an if statement or something like that. 
So as a result, I'd say that maybe 10% of the people that do programming are very, very confident in structured text. And I may be actually giving a little bit extra to that. Um, it may be less than that. But structured text has its uses. And so with when we rebuilt the compiler and everything with the new L8s and we've done all of our improvements with those with the quad core technology and having one core for code execution, one core for comms, one core for motion, and now finally a core for safety. Um, when, we've re when we did that, we made a bunch of improvements to the code execution and basically now it's, you should use whatever code language makes sense for your application. There isn't, for the most part, a real advantage execution wise of using one versus another. So I've actually got something running inside of this controller I'll show you later that actually proves that, that the code execution is almost identical. The, so with that, use structured text when it makes sense. So ladder is very good for turning on outputs, inputs, so, so on. Structured text is very good for doing things like if statements, case statements, loops, while both types, for and while. It's very good for doing those type of applications. So if you're looking at doing data analysis in a, a large array, for loops and while loops make a lot of sense. If you're trying to move a big hunk of data from one place, place to the other, you can do that in one line, very similar to a copy function in ladder. So it's, certain pieces make, make, make handling data very easy. It's also a lot easier to be able to see math functions because you can just type them out. This times that plus that, square root of this, divide by two, so on. So it makes all of that stuff very easy. Now, as far as how it looks, it reads like a book. Uh, not sure what kind of books that I'm used to reading, but it reads kind of like a book. So it, it's very much left to right, kind of runs the way that you would look at anything. And so we have different functions within there, but basically it, starting on line 29, you have if something, and assuming it's true, then I will do the thing underneath. If it's not true, I'm gonna to go to below that, I'm gonna skip rung line 30, go straight to 32 and say, well, else if, so rung 29 was false, so I'm gonna go evaluate rung 32. And it completely skips the code in the middle. So basically within structured text, you do a lot of jumps. You can build a lot of jumps into your code and make certain pieces of code where you don't reset your bits because you can actually jump over them many, many, many times. And it does it very, very easily and cleanly where you don't, in ladder doing jumps and stuff, trying to skip writing to outputs and so on is very difficult. So it's, it's an easy way of getting rid of a lot of latches and unlatches and weird case statement where you've got multiple cases of how you want stuff to run. And then in the case that rung 32 is false as well, so not the first thing and the second thing and the third thing, if all of those are false, you know, if that result is false, then I will jump to line 35 and be done. So it allows you to, to do that kind of weird check. Now it's, it, it's written down. So as the, the part that most people find difficult is that, you know, you don't necessarily always see the values underneath. That's a new thing. That's one of the enhancements for version 31 and 32 is that you now have values underneath telling you what the values of those tags are before you kind of had to go look at them someplace else and figure out what, what is the value of this and then go back and be like, okay, well, what would it have been had it still been that value? And, you know, structured text is a little bit of a bear sometimes. So I've always, I've always kind of pushed structured text as use it in function blocks. So use it in add-on instructions. Use it in something where you need to do a function and you can prove it completely and then walk away from it forever. Where you don't have a guy out in the field that feels he's gonna need to get in there and figure out what's going on. Because you know sometimes the code can get very complicated. So we have added a couple of pieces in version 31 and 32 that make structured text a more usable more user-friendly language, um, kind of 
keeping up with everybody else, I guess, in that case. The guy got a standing ovation when he released it, and I was kind of telling everybody to sit down because he's 10 years late. But the, uh, hopefully he's not on the call. <laughs> So that is showing whether there's been a change. So that is another new function, showing whether there's been any, any changes in that piece of code. So any other, I've got like 15 pages of structured text, so. We've added in the function to show the line numbers. That was something we didn't have before. That makes things very, very simple for being able to figure out where your problem is when the error code would spit back that's on this line and you don't have a line number to go to. So we have line numbers now. Uh, I believe it is, but it's there if you ever wanna turn it off and make it invisible, I guess. Um, we've changed the syntax highlighting. So it shows a little more directly what tags are working, what ones aren't, where your problem is, as compared to just highlighting everything. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. So you can cross-reference any tag from one to the other. So we've added in some better descriptive tools. Anytime you call a function within structured text, it you have to put in the parameters for it and knowing what order to put the parameters in. Typically when you do that in ladder, you drag a move function in just for the sake of one that we probably all know. It's got, you know, two parameters in it, parameter one and parameter two, or in Rockwell speak, zero and one. And so we've got these two different parameters. We need to put them in the right order so things go in the right place. And the same is the case with all of our instructions in structured text, but sometimes we forget because we don't know what the order was of all of those parameters off the top of our head. Then you spend four hours playing around in the help files trying to figure it out. We've simplified that so that it will show you what they're supposed to be. And so in the case of like the find, you've got four different elements there and you have to put tags in for each one of those elements, but you don't really know what they are off the top of my head. I don't know what order the find functions are, but by highlighting it, it tells me that the first element is, is gonna be what I'm searching, the set or my source, my second element's what I'm searching for, my third element is my start, and my fourth element is my result. Tells me right out right there, just holding it over. So that was, that was not there before, so that is a giant improvement. So we also have the completion, completion prompt, where basically it knows what you're trying to do and it will tell you that like you've completed the end if function. And then it changes to the verify bar. So if you make any change detected before you have verified it. So to your case, what the yellow and green bar are if you make a change to the text simply adding a space probably or something like that or change uh, something and you haven't hit the verify button yet it's going to be yellow because at that point you don't necessarily know it's going to be good until you actually have done the syntax check and make sure i didn't forget a semicolon or something crazy like that and by the way the end of any instruction in, in structured text ends with a semicolon for those that don't know So we've added in code snippets, which basically allow for you know, people like myself that forget sometimes when I'm doing a for loop, how do I put in a for loop? <laughs> like the for part's easy and the do part's easy, but the for this equals that to this by that, you know, for, for I equals, you know, one to 10 by one. So I wanna go I equals one, then two, then three, then four, all the way up to 10. That part gets a little like, how was that supposed to go again? So I either have to go find another piece of code where I did it or go search the help files for four hours and then I'm good. So this allows for basically, you start typing in an if and it will finish it for you. So it lets you know what other pieces. So when you start typing in four, you then just keep hitting the tab key and it will start adding in all of the different snippet so that you can see on a for loop, I wanna take i, my counter, and I wanna have it equal to my initial value and go to my final value. And you can also add in a by and 
what your increment is supposed to be. So if you didn't want to go by one, you could go by 10 or 12 or two or whatever your, whatever your favorite number is. We also added in the capability of collapsing. So another thing that is pretty common in structured text is the ability to collapse a loop. I know my for loop is good, so I'm gonna collapse it. So now it just takes up two lines and now I can look at everything else around it. And then we can look at collapsing different pieces. They added in a, another function where we can collapse an entire group. But here you can collapse any of those, any of the minus signs. You can collapse those and when you hold over it, it will highlight what's gonna be collapsed. And then region is where you can say, I want this whole thing to collapse. So you can put in your own region and say, I don't just wanna collapse this for loop or while loop or whatever, I wanna collapse this whole program or subsection of my program down initially. So I'm not getting too many deer in the headlights looks. So I must have a lot of people here that understand structured text or everybody's asleep from food. And I think it's, I think it's more food induced. Um, we added in zooming capability. And then you can also do a multi-line select, but not just a multi-line select in the whole thing, but you can actually select individual elements at the beginning. And by doing that, you can change them from YY test speed to be some other var variable. So you can copy and paste in from like Excel. So that makes, very, makes it very easy to do a lot of mass editing inside of structured text. I've always, like I said, I've always used structured text for data manipulation, those type of things. Um, we also added in the online value monitor, which is a huge bonus. And that's the part where it gets real difficult to understand what your code's supposed to be doing if you don't know what the data is. All right. So then, like I said, the structured text editor, it's all nice and easy with all the constructs and everything. It's very easy to play with. So I put this one back in here so we could kind of talk about the different loops. So the reason that I love structured text, I just like it, I love it. So is it simplifies a lot of things. Now your, your if then statements are very typical, you can do that in ladder very, very easily. If then statements are you know, just a, a rung of ladder. The benefit of structured text is doing things like case statements where you've got the ability to have 10 different modes that, the thing, that, that this piece of equipment's supposed to run in. I've got a maintenance mode, a setup mode, a, a running mode, a cleaning mode, a, a, you know, a couple different modes if I wanted to go beyond that. And I can make them mutually exclusive using a case statement where the other code is literally not executed. It is just skipped. So if whatever it was gonna do in auto mode, if I'm not in auto mode, it doesn't even look at that code. It completely skips it. Typically to do that in ladder, I'd have to do like a weird comparison at the beginning of every single rung or build a couple of jump statements to skip sections of code or put them in individual subroutines and call subroutines based off of what mode I'm in. So it simplifies a lot of those pieces. The other one is the ability to do like for loops and while loops. I love both. Both are fun. Each one has their own purpose. For loops are great for doing mass data stuff where you need to get it done in one rung. You need to get it done before anything else continues. So for loops are great for like indexing a shift register. Not in the standard shift register that it's a bit. You know, do I have something present? But like a shift register that has multiple different things about whatever's being shifted. To the point like in some automotive plants you have shift registers that have like a thousand pieces to them that are moving down the line so you're not just shifting one element you're shifting an entire excel spreadsheet basically <laughs> um so they're very good for doing that where you can start at the back and work your way to the front and shift them all down by one and and it's nice and clean because you can do it is move element number 90 to element number 100 or, or 90 to 91 and then move 89 to 90 
so you don't lose any data. Just work your way from the bottom to the top, just shifting everything down one. But by the time you come out of this, it's done. The downside of it is you just did a whole bunch of stuff in one scan of the code and hopefully it wasn't so much stuff that you hit the watchdog or affected your scan time in a way that is detrimental to the running of the machine. So keeping both of those, you know, like only do that when the machine's not running or doing something important. That's why I like the while loop as well. I can do the exact same thing in a while loop, but now at the end of it, it is doing, I can do basically the same thing in a while loop, but the for loop goes to a special end, a while loop basically can stop in the middle. So I can make it stop whenever. And then the last way of doing it is in an if statement, which like I said, isn't much different than ladder, but you can increment a counter every scan. And then each time you come by, you do the next one, then you do the next one. So for doing like things like searching inside of a, searching inside of a recipe, for a name or something like that, where I don't need it right now. I'm dealing with one second scan from an HMI. I don't need it immediately. I want my machine to still run fine. So I'm just gonna do one instance per scan. You can do the, all of these functions can be done in ladder, just not in that clean of a format. So you can do any of this stuff in ladder and people have been for years. It's just one of those when you go find that piece of code that somebody wrote and you look at it and go, uh, this is going to take a couple of days and a beer, you know, for me to understand what this means. You know, it's like, okay, I, I know that he's doing something here, but I don't know what it is. So any questions on structured text? How am I doing on time? Oh, plenty of time. Again, this is what happens when you let me design things. <clears throat> so one of my uh, little side hobbies and things that I enjoy is finding all of the places where we go wrong. And because I typically sometimes every now and then get a phone call from a customer saying, well, this isn't working the way I thought it was going to work. Or why is this not working? And there's a lot of different reasons. Some people copy code from one system to another. Some, sometimes you go from a, uh, a PLC to a PAC. Our control logics and compact logics are PACs, which do communications asynchronously. And so when you write to an output, it basically writes to it immediately and you end up with weird, weird little anomalies where sometimes, you know, in a PLC, you would write to an output, you'd move a value to an analog. And at any point before the end of the scan, you moved it to something else, the last thing would win. But in our control logics and compact logics, you'll get weird blips because it's gonna write the one value and then it's gonna write the next. And so every now and then, there'll be enough of a delay that the output will, you know, it'll actually accept the previous value and have time to act on it. And not not in it, you know those type of weird things. So in a tr in the in that effort, we've got reels. So I actually pulled this from a tech note. I don't have the tech note number memorized, but I pulled it from a tech note that basically goes into telling us about reels and so on, but a reel is a floating point, which is 32 bits, and of that, so a certain amount of that is data, the actual number, and the rest of it is the exponent. And in a 32 bits, you only have so much real estate, which basically means you only really have six significant figures within a reel, which means if I wanna add one to a million, and I do it with a reel, it may not change. I may just stay at a million. And I could add one to it a million times and still be at a million because I'm within the round off error. I can't add one to it. There isn't enough granularity. So at some point that happens. So typically what ends up happening is we have some people that will add and do an accumulation or something like that or accumulator and we'll add to this reel and keep adding to it and add to it and add to it. And eventually it gets so big that 
it no longer cares what you're adding to it because you're now in the noise. And that's pretty common across mul multiple platforms. Um, so this talks about a couple different instances about multiplication and so on. You know, specifically if you multiply those two numbers together, your 10 digit calculator would give you one answer, but our controller would give you something different. The first six digits would match, but after that, it's noise. That they're insignificant at that point. So what does this mean? <laughs> Before that, I got my slides out of order. So actually, I think I'm just gonna skip this and come back. So what does this mean for minimizing error? Now, I, I did this in my VM and it kind of scales weird, so it's a little small. But <clears throat> if I was gonna build a totalizer, how would I build it if I don't wanna just add to a real and end up with round off error? Well, you can do something as simple as this. Now there's a few assumptions behind this and I'll explain them in a moment. But basically, you take the real value, add whatever it is that you're trying to totalize to it into itself, and then say if that value is ever greater than 100 or something like that, pick a number, I'm going to add that number to my totalizer and subtract it from my real. So at this point, by using 100, I still have four decimal places of accuracy. So I'm minimizing my round off error. I, I always can, I consistently keep four decimal places of accuracy at least, sometimes more. And when I hit 100, I drop it back down, but I didn't set it to zero. I kept whatever the remainder was. It may have been 100.54. And now I still have 0.54 to start with. So keeping, so a lot of times we make our own error <laughs> because we would reset it to zero and be like, okay, it's 100, let's start over. And well, we lost a little bit. Well, a little bit doesn't always matter, but at the end of the week it might, or at the end of the day, depending on how fast you're scanning this. So the assumption, basically what this is, is a integration and a, the, a couple of assumptions is that the value that I'm looking at is in the correct units. My input is in the appropriate units for me to be able to add it together. Nine times out of 10, it's not. Typically it's not. Typically you're looking at gallons per minute or something like that. Well, okay. And then this code is running in some sort of a routine. So I put it in a one second interrupt routine. So if I'm running gallons per minute and it's been a second from the last time this is scanned, how much do I add to the totalizer? Well, whatever my input is in gallons per minute divided by 60 is what I really need to put in there, is my add. Because I'm only, I am only looked at it for the last second. So it depends on how, how you look at the code and how you modify it. So sometimes you have to every now and then dust out the math book, you know, be like, oh, okay, how do I do this? and figure out which way you want to make this work. So you can run these types of code in the background, but one of the assumptions I made when I wrote this is that I know what the time base is because there's no timers in front of it. There's nothing there. It just runs, just adds. If I was doing that in the background, I could add the wrong, I could add data very, very quickly. And then every now and then my for loop runs and I didn't add data for a while and, and so on. So the, basically what we're doing is looking at a signal integration where I'm taking each point in time in a way that I wrote that code, it would take the line to the right up top and build that over. So I don't take, I'm, I'm basically taking the new data point and running it for the last amount of time. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this type of approximation, but basically that's the way I wrote the code is, so whatever the data point is now, that's what I'm assuming it was for the last 100 milliseconds. And I'm gonna add that to my total, and then 100 milliseconds from now, I'm going to assume that the data point is what it is then, but it, all the way back to when I know it was something different. Now, if you wanna really be, cool about it, you can start averaging and doing things like that, where you average the beginning number and the last number together and give you a more accurate square wave. But basically you're trying to approximate 
this signal. And one of the things that's the easiest thing to manage is the time. Now, if you put something in a 10 millisecond task, 10 millisecond time interrupt, how often does it scan? That it, wrong. Close to 10 milliseconds. Almost 10 milliseconds. It doesn't necessarily always scan at exactly 10 milliseconds. You know, and anybody in quantum physics would tell us that 10 milliseconds is never going to happen. <laughs> we'll be close, but we'll never quite be there. So it's a, there's always a variation in that. And that's why I was saying about like you do it in a background scan, there's variation in my scan time. You can limit that by putting it into an interrupt task. But if I have, for the sake of argument, half a millisecond of time variation between when my task is going to scan, Sometimes it might be nine and a half milliseconds. Sometimes it might be 10 and a half milliseconds. It'll typically be closer to 10. What happens percentage wise when I try to run that code at one millisecond? I do it in a one millisecond interrupt task. Now with a half a millisecond of error. So I may be more accurate in that my steps are smaller, but now I'm less accurate in that my steps are now variable length because my steps are anywhere from 0.5 seconds to 1.5 seconds or 1.5 milliseconds to 1.5 milliseconds which would be a, a huge variation percentage wise of my one millisecond and so that's how you, one way to limit error is to use a larger time span where your error is a smaller proportion of the overall value that makes sense so when you're doing totalizers and stuff like that and that's time matters and if you do something in an interrupt task a time interrupt task you really don't need a timer in front of it because you know what the time is effectively now not like, like I said it's not going to be perfectly 10 but it's going to be hopefully near as makes no difference 10 and if it needs to be exactly 10, you set it at a higher priority because it'll be closer to 10 because less stuff will be interfering with it. So looking at the time bias there is kind of like what I was talking about a little bit ago. We've got the variation in this time, the 10 milliseconds. It's not always 10 milliseconds. Sometimes it's 9.5, sometimes it's 10.5. This happens in other things as well. So this is not necessarily, I'm not I'm going to step back from what we were just talking about and talk about a slightly different problem. When we talk about comms, communications, as much, it, we have complete control over what's going on inside of our controllers. If we, if, if we have a race in there, it's our own problem. We didn't mean to make one, but we made one. But externally, when you send something out to another controller or something else and then expect it to come back or send it out and you want it to get there at a specific time, you know, the easiest one is watchdogs. So I'm going to do a communication watchdog. Every, if I don't have communication between my two controllers within one, for one second, I'm going to cause an alarm. All right, well, how do I do that? Well, every half a second, I'm going to change this bit from zero to one on one of my controllers and expect it, the other one to see it and then send it back. So, okay, half a second, update on a one second time, that I should see that. Well, no, not necessarily. Because let's say that you were at zero, half a second later, it went to one, and not quite half a second later, it went back to zero. Well, there's your one second, you just sent the message across to the other controller saying, hey, here's my new value at one second, it's still zero. So you have to invert that basically and make it so that you're sending the data faster than the pulses. And you have to be more than two times faster. Because if you're exactly two times faster, where I'm sending data every half second and my data updates every second, there's always a possibility that you can make an oops. There, there, you have to be at least two times faster because if you're if you're sending data every half a second, I miss it on the front end, I see it in the middle, I miss it on the back end. But the next one's seeing it for three times. But if I have any other issues in there where I typically most people have this built on top of something else, 
where I'm looking at another piece of data that's being handed back and forth and suddenly you end up doubling that. I always say at least two times. If you do it exactly two times, you'll most likely see the data. If you do it more than two times, you'll see it. So if you communicate three times in the time that the signal is updated, you'll, you'll see it. The only reason I bring it up is because I've probably had about a dozen phone calls about that in the last six years. So it, does, it happens more often than you'd think. This isn't one phone call that's prompting me to talk about this. So it, it does happen. So we assume on our control side that we know our time. We know how fast everything's running. Our math is gonna be perfect. Our reels are infinite accuracy. You know, we make these assumptions, but you know, at some point that, that, that we have to kind of be like, all right, maybe there is a variation. If I can't control it, can I mitigate it? And if I can't mitigate it, at what level does it become acceptable? Because I know I've worked on a couple of totalizers in the past that we were able to get at the end of an eight hour run, 1% accuracy out of a controller off a flow meter. So my controller running the raw data out of the flow meter compared to the actual totalizer from the flow meter was within 1% at the end of an eight hour shift. We were able to improve it beyond that actually, but 1% was the first, first shot. So there's ways to do it. Depends on what the value is coming across. If you're bringing in raw values, there is always error. Right. So when you're bringing in the in the in the value for for you know let's say a, an analog signal, there's the accuracy of the card that always adds a little bit of error. There's the communication time. There is how fast are you updating it? Uh, you know across the backplane, how fast is the AFC module looking at that data? And then what type of approximation are they using for capturing a square wave based off of that? Because everything we do in programming is digital, it's not analog. We're looking at some, add something at a certain time. So there is error, but the error is small enough that it meets all of the standards. It's not, it's not worse than anybody else's basically, is what it boils down to. That's how it's certified, anything that's certified, anybody that does any of the measurements and tests on those type of things, there is a, a there is an acceptable amount of error always. It's just do it, is it one percent, point one percent, point oh one percent is allowable? And how many of those can I add together before I'm not allowable? Because <laughs> you have to look at the total system. So I get you know half a percent of error here, half a percent of error here, half a percent of error there. It's more than. 1.5, you know, it's one point, it's 0.5 error percent error, you know, so you got a little bit of a problem, possibly, depending. So yes, it, it is very accurate. They're doing it in the way that it's supposed to be done, but it's not perfect. There, there isn't such a thing as a perfect signal. So the reason I, like I said, I accidentally put the slide in the wrong spot, but I come back to it. Version 32, we added a new, a little bit of new 64-bit math. So we've also added in a couple unsigned uh, integers and so on. But the benefit of an unsigned integer is that if I'm using it to count how many containers I've run through my machine and I'm using an integer, I get to 32,767 or whatever, and it suddenly goes negative. And it's like, how do I run negative containers? You know, and, it, and it's one of those, you use that as a totalizer and you just forget that, just, you know, somebody forgot to reset it and older PLCs had possibly cause it to turn a nice red light on, but you know, and ours it just, it'll continue running, you just have a negative number. Um, the unsigned basically doubles that number and then it just resets to zero. So in case the operator never reset their container count. Um, that's another reason why sometimes you use double integers in those type of applications. The one piece that I had made a mental note of on my way in today to talk about was just that exact point do a gut check on any of your math. So if I run this machine at this rate for the next 20 years, what is my number gonna look like? Well, how many containers am I gonna make? Am I gonna make enough to overflow my double integer? 
do I need to take that into consideration if I'm doing a lifetime whatever count? Or am I fine with just a regular integer? Yeah, you know, looking at those type of things, when you, when you come up with this data type, just kind of do that quick gut check on the backside going, okay, I know the machine's gonna run this fast. This is a value I've got. How many hours can I run the machine before I end up with an issue? And sometimes you'd be surprised how short it is. <laughs> so th that would be a, a little gut check. Now, the, one of the best ones I came out with is the long reel. So the L reel. L reel is a 64-bit reel and it gives us that. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that I can go back to using a reel and adding an integer to it and just keep adding to it. That doesn't mean that I have to go back to the old way and don't still do it the good way. What it does mean though is that I can go further down the bad way before I have a problem. <laughs> So anybody that ever plays with motion on stuff that runs continuously in coder counts and so on, a you know, say I've, I've got something that moves a foot and it's off by a thousandth of an inch. I run a thousand whatever's cycles and I'm off by an inch. Well, that thousand cycles may take a week, that thousand cycles may take 10 minutes. But in the case of servo motors and encoders, that's not necessarily always a thousand. Sometimes it's a one millionth of an inch. But a million containers later, I need to rehome my machine. My machine is now out of time. Mm, I don't think, I don't think every data type does 64. I don't think every, every uh, math instruction supports 64 yet. Um, I'd say still use it sparingly. You use the L reels where you need them. This is a version 32 thing. Um, so use them where you need them, where you need the accuracy. Because for the longest time we didn't have them. We didn't have these 64-bit giant numbers, so. Right. I don't think so. I think the way that they programmed it, and I may be wrong, but I'd, I'd have to verify, maybe uh, call Chris and see what he says about how they programmed it for whether the data, si data structure is still 32-bit data structure that we're shoehorning a 64-bit into or whether we change the fundamental format to 64-bit. I'm guessing it's actually the first one where it's still 32-bit and we're shoehorning a 64 into it. Just based on my knowledge of the people that would be programming it in a way that, because we would have, otherwise we would have come out with that with Studio a long time when the L8s came out originally. You're, do, you're doing twice as much data calculation, comparison, conversion, so yeah. Well, when you're using an L8, everything is very, very quick, so it's gonna be twice as much time of very, very quick, so maybe. <laughs> Right, I mean, if, you know, you know, let's say it takes a nanosecond to do this comparison, now it takes two. Okay, so as long as I only do that in a few places in my code, probably not. If I com converted all my code to L reels and it took two milliseconds before, I might be at three or four now. Because you're, you're doubling the amount of data the processor has to chew. Is this going to be all the best? Yes. <laughs> So I think that is, yes. So I don't know how much time I have left. I always try to leave a little time for a demo. I got seven minutes. Anybody wanna see something cool for about the next seven minutes? Yes, duct tape, my friend duct tape. So I've got, this uh, next gen compact logics down here, which has the same horsepower, the same processing capability of an L8 control logics. And it ru is running all these different types of compute and uh, functions. And I've got basically right here, all of the different types of functions, uh, programming languages. So once this lets me get online, which I sure hope it will. 
Oh. <laughs> Come back. So if I was to do a monitor on this structured text, they did the exact same code basically in all four of these languages. So looking at the min and max, you know, I'm running right around 172 mi what, microseconds, 190 microseconds to execute that code. I come up and look at the exact same code, but now in ladder, and it's effectively the same, 181, 178, it'll eventually probably pop up to 190. And if I go look at it in sequential function chart, obviously that one isn't necessarily good for doing a lot of math. And then there, that was function block, this one's sequential function chart. And so again, you can, you can see that there's a difference in scan time there, but when you look at what's going on in each of these, we're doing basically the same exact thing. So we're doing the same exact math is happening in all of them. And so when you look at what the addition is doing inside of structured text, it's just literally adding this number to that number and putting it in here. And just for the purpose of creating scan time is really all it's doing, but to show you that there's, there is a difference. Now, if I was doing this and programming it, I would have done a for loop <laughs> where I would have made these a part of an array where I could index through them as compared to writing and copying and pasting out all 149 lines of this code, I would have done it in five because, because I'm lazy. But it, it, it may have made it faster, actually. So. And so this is in version 30. And if I come over to version 32, you can see that we've a little different view there. Um, I, I was gonna show you the logical organizer. So in version 30, in the logical organizer, I can orient and adjust where all of my code goes based off of the function. I can come in here and add in a new folder and call it my, is my folder, and my folder includes some demo control. So, you know, I, I could, that could be line one, could be line two, and so on. So you can, and you can change these on the fly, and they have no effect on how the actual code is being executed. Because when you look over here, I've got a bunch of, I've got a, a time interrupt task, a couple of those. I don't have a background task. So, and then, like I was saying, so over here I was doing this in my background task. So the way I would fix this, this totalizer for running it in my background task is I would add in a timer and say when that timer is done, do this. Now keeping in mind that a timer takes one scan to reset. So there's error I'm tossing in there because it takes one scan to reset. So it, and I'm not always gonna see it exactly when the timer's done. I'm gonna see it within a scan of whenever the timer was done. So I'm adding in basically up to two scans of error when doing it in the background task. So like they say there's, when you look at some of the minutia on how not to lose and how to minimize your error, that's one of the, uh, the key, key pieces. So I know some people do have every now and then do pieces that do things that require very, very accurate coding. Um, so, but this is basically how you can do square wave integration. I can use this function on anything. I can use it off of the RPM of a drive. The input, take the input return from a VFD, tells me how fast the drive is going, say it's running a conveyor. And I know how fast the conveyor is running when it's running at that speed. I could convert basically those RPM into real speed and I could integrate that, which means as the drive speeds up and slows down, I could have a pretty accurate, not perfect, idea of where whatever it is is on the, on the conveyor. 
So if I had a sensor that said, hey, there's something going by, I could have a rough idea of where it is on that conveyor as it goes down. So you can do these type of math functions all over the place. The other one is to do a combination of this with a division function where you can look at how much you add in, you say it every so many milliseconds, I'm gonna capture the data. Once I've captured that data, I'm now going to average maybe the last five pieces of that data. And then I can divide it by how long it took to do that. And it gives me the rate of what the thing was running at. So in a case of, you know, like trying to, you know, understand where I'm going and where I'm going to be so I can turn off early so I don't overshoot type of thing. So when you're doing, again, with types of VFD control, flow meters, things like that, you could basically say, hey, I know the tank's going to overfill because it's going to take me this amount of time to turn off. So I need to turn off this much early. So there, there's ways, very easy ways to do approximate differentials and integrals. I know that that's usually the point where I lose half the people in the audience. And, uh, but that's the, how you can approximate the area underneath the curve or the slope. Then run that out. So I am at one o'clock. So I've probably been fired. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess I need to be done so I can let you all go back to work. You don't have to go back to work, but you know, I, I won't tell your boss. The, uh, so next, next month we're doing controller safety process safety and machine safety. So our users group topic next month is process safety, machine safety. So feel free to join us for that. We're gonna be talking about guard logics and different SIL applications. So any questions? All right, thanks for coming.